All righty, so the uh, class on biblical theology is over. Uh, we finished that last week, and um, we needed to fill up the rest of the month of May, and so we're going to do some filler. No, <laughs> no, just kidding, sort of. So <laughs> let me pray, and I'll explain more. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for guiding your church. Lord, thank you for meeting us in worship, meeting our needs in Christ. Thank you for your great love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so actually what we thought would be kind of wise would be to give a presentation to all the congregation who wants to. We did this back in the fall for Sunday school leaders and community group leaders and people who wanted to come just by volunteering to be there about uh, the vision of the church. So I kind of want to walk you through the process and kind of how we ended up where we are, kind of what the church is sort of about and always has been and always will be about. So so SPC had a mission statement. It's been there for a very long time. It's committed to Christ and His Word. It's on the front of the bulletin. It's right there. And very simple. And then we had a purpose statement as well. You might remember this one. This is to know Christ personally, to mature spiritually, to build community, and to show God's love faithfully. Okay? So that's the, that's the foundation that we were building on. That's the named vision and purpose of the church. And so, you know, we already had a mission statement, we already had a purpose statement, what was missing, what the session kind of came together and talked about was, was kind of a vision for guiding the specific resourcing of our mission and purpose. And so to that end, the elders met, prayed, studied, and discerned what our key values would be. And so we've kind of just, starting in the fall, kind of just released those key values into the wild of our church just to see kind of what would simmer up from people, and so to see kind of what the Holy Spirit does in the church. That's the process that we started with, and so building on that purpose statement, you know, we have, so to know Christ, this is new life, to mature spiritually, this is discipleship, to build community, that's the idea of equipping and fellowship, and then to show God's love, that's missions or being missional. So there are already priorities contained in the purpose, and then through prayer, study, and discussion, we fleshed out those into actionable values. And so what the session did, it wasn't just the sitting session, it was all the elders, even those who were on, on their sabbatical. Um, we got together last fall for several long meetings to pray and to discuss and to make lists and to answer questions. And we got all this data that Marty and I were able to kind of collate and see similarities, and we actually were able to come to a unanimous agreement on some fundamental principles, which is really cool to actually a group of that many people that have come to something truly uh, unanimous. So we, and we came up with the same values that basically were already there. So our, value, our values from elder prayer and from Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, which we'll get to in a second, is the same values that were already contained in the purpose statement. We didn't do this on purpose. It just happened to be that, you know, when we, when we coalesce these things, these are the same things. So you might have heard our Four words we like to use sometimes, live, grow, thrive, go. That's the exact same values from the, the purpose statement. New life and fellowship, discipleship, equipping, missional. So the actionable values are built on the existing priorities. And so basically, all that to say is that the vision is like a coat of paint and that the purpose and mission of SPC has stayed the same. It's the same building, just a different coat of paint kind of like here, you know, instead of being a metaphor, it actually is reality, so it's the same place. All right, so here's an overview. So Sycamore has not changed its core values. We're just changing the wrapping of those values. We're changing the emphasis of the value. So we have our vision statement now is a robust church, joyfully united to Jesus, our community, and each other. So robust kind of picks up on that equipped and disciple, we grow and thrive. United to Jesus is a New Testament phrase for new life. That's where we get live from. We're united to our community. This means we're on mission, missional right here. That's our go value. And then we're united to each other. This is, again, a, the New Testament phrase for fellowship, live and, and thrive. So this is new words for, o, for old ideas. And I do want to own one big change, whereas the previous verbiage kind of emphasized gaining knowledge of Christ. The new verbiage emphasizes union with Jesus, and the key to being in union with each other is our union with Jesus, and the key to being on mission faithfully is our union with Jesus. So 
we, we, we kind of wanted to do this because union with Jesus is more holistic and a biblical idea than just gaining knowledge because we're not just brains and bats, right? We're whole bodies. God made us with bodies to be on earth. And so this idea of being in union with Christ encompasses all these ideas of being more Christ-like in our thoughts, being more Christ-like in our heart, being more Christ-like in our deeds, being more Christ-like in our relationships. So it's a more holistic idea to capture that. So basically what it says also is that we want to make sure that we're pouring energy into things that emphasize our union with Christ. And so we need Sunday school classes and we need seminars, but we're also whole persons and so we're being introduced to the person of Jesus through other people and through our neighborhoods. And so one of the values that the elders felt was kind of being de-emphasized and wanted to really be brought up was the idea of fellowship. And so fellowship is much more emphasized under our vision. And, one of the, and we did all this last year before the construction project, and one of the tangible aspects of the session's new, um, new vision of really emphasizing fellowship is the redesign of the foyer. We kind of looked around and said, man, we got a great worship space, we got 27 classrooms, and we got nowhere to fellowship together. And so we said, let's do something about that. So we changed our entry hall into a meditative place to prepare for worship. We, we changed that, not because that's bad, because that, now we have a different emphasis. We changed our, our, our entry space into a fellowship space. And you'll notice, no one told y'all to start talking more. No one told y'all to hang out there more, did we? No, the design team did a great j j job of actually incarnating that value and making it a place where people just want to hang out and talk and have fellowship. So well done, design team. Well done, deacons, for overseeing the construction of it. That's kind of the idea. We want to emphasize fellowship more. That's just one small aspect. So how do we get here? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 16. I know this is kind of small, but I tried to get it all on as much on a slide as I could. I'll read it for you. You can just listen to so Ephesians chapter 4. Paul says this, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your calls, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. So Paul here is emphasizing the unity of the church, how we're one in substance. Then he goes on in verse 7, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led hosts a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. So the ascended Savior gives gifts. We miss this analogy because we're a democracy, but even people who are still alive today who were around when the current Queen of England was enthroned as her coronation, Sinclair Ferguson is one of my um, friends and mentors, and he tells a story about how when he was a school child, when, when the current Queen was uh, coronated, that every single school child in England got a box of cookies as a gift from the queen to them. So when monarchs ascend their throne, they give gifts. In the ancient Roman world, when you had a triumphant general come back from conquering somebody, he would be elevated on this high seat, and he would give of the plunder he stole, took, conquered, whatever you want to call it, he would give that to the audience who, who was watching. So it's a very familiar metaphor. So what he's saying is Jesus Christ has ascended to the throne, and as the sitting, reigning king, he gives gifts to his people. So now he outlines what those gifts are. <clears throat> and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So especially leaders who equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, those are gifts. And then on in verse 13 and following, he says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be, be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So the end of all these gifts is to get us to unity, get us to maturity, get us to stability in the church. Notice the bold type in this slide and the next slide. Those are Jesus' goals for the church. What does he Want. He wants us to attain unity. He wants us to attain knowledge. He wants us to attain maturity, all because we're anchored in him. And it goes on the last two verses. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint from which is it equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And so we see here in these verses that we're growing up into Jesus. We're growing up in love. It's Christ 
focused. So union with Jesus is the foundation. And he creates that union by the Spirit. And then verse 12 and verse 16 are the actions that leaders then take from verse 11 in the church. So you put all that together, and this is the passage that we meditated on for several months, looking at, and as we're praying through these lists, we, and we discern from these, kind of, it established our direction. So, how does Jesus create unity and maturity in his church? Verse 12 says, he equips the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body. And in verse 15, he says, he does all this stuff, we speak the truth in love, why? So that the, the very last sentence, the body itself builds itself up in love. So we have these four kind of big things that stick out in the text. That there's, that God, Jesus gives gifts to equip the saints. Those gifts then help the saints themselves do the work of ministry. So the body is built up. See, it's outside coming in. And then notice, because we have all that good stuff, the very last line, we're able to also build ourselves up. So what that led us to is these four main directives where we see that we're supposed to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up the body, and it builds itself up in love. So these are four main directives we got from this passage. And then we move from directives to values. So equip the saints, work of ministry, building up the body, build itself up in love. Gets us to equipping. That was a hard one, right? Equip the saints is equipping, yeah. Rocket science right there. All right, next one is the work of ministry. This is missions. Building up the body is discipleship, and then build itself up in love is fellowship. So, I, I mean, I don't want to beat this dead horse, but I just think it's really cool that we, we had the, the vision, the purpose statement already, and we weren't ignoring it, but we really weren't emphasizing that. We were looking at this text only and trying to discern it. I just love how the Holy Spirit does this thing where, like, here's a new, fresh emphasis that you've already had. It was really great. It's the same values from that. It's just great. So... We have these things. So these are the values that the elders believe should characterize Sycamore. What is our church about? We, we, we want to be about equipping the saints. We want to be about missions. We want to be about discipleship. And we want to be about fellowship. All of those equally emphasized. So notice fellowship, by the way, is its own indistinct, no, it's not indistinct, its own distinct value. It has value in and of itself. And this is one of the gentle foibles the session kind of became aware of as we went through this process is that we're, we're, we're kind of, we kind of miss fellowship a little bit. We all, and, and I'll give you an example. Someone calls a church activity. You know what? Let's just get together. Let's just have some coffee. Maybe play a board game. Maybe, 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 maybe you can invite your friends and neighbors to it. We're not going to do a Bible study. So that way you can bring some non-Christian friends. But let's just get together and have some fun. And you go. And there's this presupposition, and I have it too, that oh, but we need, to, we need to Jesus it up somehow, don't we? Right? Don't we, should we like pray? Or maybe should we like, can we read a scripture or sing a hymn? Right? Why? Because fellowship's not enough. We got to do something else, right? See, that, that's a foible of our kind of socioeconomic demographic because we don't really understand fellowship in and of itself is an edifying thing. Christians being together in and of itself is edifying. And so... One, we want, really wanted to emphasize fellowship events. That guys, you can just get together and just experience the love of Jesus and bring your non-Christian friends and let them see it as an outsider. And be like, what is that? How, do, you, how, you, do you know these people that well? Because y'all seem to have this like, relationship. It really is cool. One of the things that we found in, in, in Boston as we were church planning is our non-Christian friends who had dear friends we're kind of jazzed at seeing Christians hang out together. Like, there's this closeness y'all have that I don't really have with other people. What, what's that about? It was really neat to see. Like, well, you just asked me a really intense personal question. Can I give you an intense personal answer? If, and all of a sudden, you get to share the gospel because they asked you to. It's great. So, anyway, so we really want to emphasize, we want to bring fellowship back into the emphasis so it gets equal emphasis. Not more, but equal emphasis among these four values. So, from values to keyword, how do we, how do we move from Values to actions to keywords. So fellowship. Fellowship is joining together in love. Discipleship is growing healthy together. We thought of a good description for that. Equipping is becoming emboldened together. And being, being missional is moving outward together. So we have the biblical directive. Then we have the ministry description. 
Those things. And then we have, and this is not a bad word, but some, some people are like, oh, in church world, you can do that? Yes. Now we have the marketing keyword because we want to talk to people who aren't part of our community in a way that they will understand, right? So we move to that to this. So we have live, this relationships. We have grow, which is knowledge. We have thrive, which is discernment. We have go, which is application. So live, grow, thrive, go rests on this foundation of all of that exegesis, of all of that biblical discernment, of all recognizing what we as a church are called to do. And then we have these marketing words where we can kind of just kind of have a very simple but yet profound to descript, description of our church. We're about live, grow, thrive, and go. So live is, is relationships. It's about we really want to be in relationship with each other and with Christ. In fact, we can't have true biblical fellowship with each other unless we're first having fellowship with Christ. And it's because we're in Christ and salvation that we are then in fellowship with each other. Because if I'm in Christ and you're in Christ, well, then we, we're t- we have fellowship, right? So this is about new life in Christ, and this is about really making our life together in Christ robust. Grow. This is about knowledge. We want to know God's Word. We want to grow in our appreciation for what He's done. We want to grow in our appreciation for Scripture. So this is about we want to grow in our faith. It's about knowledge. And then thrive is discernment. We want to use wisely what we know. We don't just want to keep it for ourselves. It's not about, I can play Bible trivia better than you. It's not about that, right? We want to discern how to live wisely. So then why? Because then we have courage and confidence to go and apply that knowledge. So we get new life in Christ. We grow in that new life. We understand how to use the, what, the, what the Bible has given us, and so we then apply after we discern. So it's this whole process together. So we get to this cycle. Oh, good. I'm glad it looks better on this slide than the slide I'm looking at. We've got to replace that projector. Okay. Anyway, so, so what do we do? We have this cycle here. So what we, what we envision for our church is this, is this cycle that just keeps going. So we start at the very top. Live, joining together. So given new life in Jesus, we become part of the fellowship of his body. We live. We join his family, a community that loves each other and loves God's word. And so as we feed on his word, we become disciples who passionately love Jesus, and we begin to hate our sin, and so we pursue after deeper and deeper holiness. In other words, we grow towards a healthy faith where because of our union with Jesus, we seek to know more of Jesus in all parts of our life. This growth brings us to a place of joy where we then thrive. That united to Jesus, we're free to be who we were meant to be rather than trying to perform to a certain persona. And so in our freedom, we are then equipped for robust, courageous ministry. And from that place of joy, we're then empowered and emboldened to go, to become missional, lovingly embracing our community to show them how much Jesus and us in him loves them. And so as we serve our community, we turn our relationships into gospel friendships through which we see more people brought into our family. They live and the cycle repeats. So you see how this is kind of like a cycle or it's a tornado. It's going to come tear up our community. That's how I like to put it. Anybody would like to ask any questions at this point or push back or clarify anything? Right, the, the, the text at the bottom was a lot bigger when I made it online, and somehow whenever you download it, I don't, I don't understand, but it says, and it's really small on my screen too, it says, rooted in the Bible, based in our history, actionable in the body, and understandable by the community. So rooted in the Bible, based in our history, actionable in the body, understandable by the community is what we're trying to do. Okay, we'll keep going. Yes. Exactly, yes. It breaks my heart, yeah. Yeah, she was just saying about you know, all the destruction right here next to Watkins, they've torn all those trees down. It's going to be a community. They're going to, they're going to put townhomes there, is what I believe the plan is. So, yeah. And so there's going to be more people there, exactly, right across the road from us. And in case you haven't heard, I mean, it's years and years down the road, but they have publicly said that the new Midlothian Middle School is going to be in a 40-acre plot along Coalfield Road which 
if you look at a map, the only place is between your neighborhood and this church. So that's going to be the new middle of middle. It's going to be right there one day, someday. So yeah, think like right in the middle. How, how cool is that that the Lord planned to put this church right in between the main schools for our entire community? Like they, they, people are not, not going to be able to help but see us and know we're here. It's great. So. I would say so. I hope so. Like right now, we had uh, this past weekend, we had uh, 18 adults in our new members class. And right now, right over in that room over there, I think there's 16 kids going through a new members class. So we're about to have a whole herd come through, which is just awesome. Um, yeah, we've got, a, you know, we've got a fellowship committee kind of started out on its own after the first presentation. Some people are like, well, can we start doing some fellowship stuff? Like, we want to do that. Like, yes, and we want to let you go. So this whole fellowship team was created themselves, really, started busting around. But anybody else got any things you've seen where there just seems to be a little bit more fellowship emphasis or seems to be some, maybe some new life somewhere? Anybody got anything to share? Yes, Mary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, the Atlantic right next to us being is just an amazing project. In fact, I wasn't here. Did this church pay to connect the sidewalk or did that contractor connect the sidewalk? We did. What an amazing idea. Like, let's just give them a sidewalk right here, right to our building. Why not? See, something like that. It's so simple, and yet it, it really endears the community to us. They see how we really care. You know, it's just, it's just, it's, it's great. Any other testimonies? Yeah, Carol. Yes. Yeah, we, we didn't want to name joy as a specific value because we felt joy was a result. That if you're doing this stuff right, okay, if you really understand the gospel, you should live in joy. You know, even in the midst of trials because you recognize that while we were sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, unrighteous, us. So you have joy. And it's also like we, tr- we try to kind of push the envelope a little bit. You may, you may have noticed some of our advertisements, especially our little, might be a little bit what you might call like, you know, irreverent. You know, like how, how how'd you guys like the uh, First Supper? Everybody, everybody see the First Supper advertisement where we, where we kind of did a reenactment of Leonardo, I almost said DiCaprio, funny, Leonardo da Vinci's um, uh, painting, the, the Last Supper. We all did the First Supper poses. We left Jesus blank because we're not stupid. So we, right and then how about our Christmas card where Marty is the star? I mean, come on. How, wasn't that the greatest Christmas card ever where Marty's up there is the, is the, is the Christmas star? Yeah. So just trying to, trying to basically lead the way and like, it's okay to be joyful. It's okay. Because one of the foibles, and I, and I was this person, one of the foibles of, the, of being a Reformed Presbyterian is like, we, sh- we, we believe in total depravity. We should recognize that how, how sinful we are. Absolutely. But, the, but Calvin would tell you, that that recognition of your sin should drive you into deep joy for the depths of what your Savior did for you. you know, so we want, to, we want to make sure we're emphasizing the whole gospel, that we're deeply joyful because we're deeply broken and even deeply forgiven. Any other questions or comments? We've got more to do, but not much, but some. Okay, we'll get into some stuff that might be considered provocative. We'll see. We'll find out. So, all right, why was there a need for an update of the mission and purpose? Well, because the PCA in general and SPC in particular grew from underchurched people, okay, Baptists and Methodists. How many of you used to go to a Baptist and Methodist church now here? Okay, there you go. Same. Who were already going to attend a church on Sunday morning. And so outreach consisted of what? Offering the highest quality and theologically faithful service and teaching. And then after the person or family attended, there were then programs and structures in place to build relationships with them so they would stay. The presuppositions of need, to use business world terms, were basically 
We need to make sure for quality control and customer service, right? Let's make sure we have good quality control and good customer service. And we still do that. Like, if, if, if you're one of those people who, who has come from another church, we hope that you have seen the highest quality, theologically faithful worship service. We hope that you have seen in-depth teaching. We hope that we have got programs and structures in place to build a relationship with you now that you've come so you'll stay. We hope you experienced that. If you didn't, I want to know. But the presupposition is what? Is quality control, customer service, people who were already going to attend a church. They were just looking for which church am I going to attend, right? And yes, let's capture all those people because not all those people are Christians and they can also be, always be made deeper disciples. So yeah, we'll take them. But that's really what our whole church was focused on. So the purpose statement uses key religious terminology to do what? To signal orthodoxy and to signal rich teaching to the churched visitor. All right? Just listen to these words. To know Christ personally, to mature spiritually, to build community to show God's love. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's exactly what it's for. It signals orthodoxy, doesn't it? You know exactly what kind of Christians we are. You know that we value rich teaching, and, and we're, we're trying to tell a church visitor, visitor these things. Nothing wrong with that, but that's a pretty narrow focus, isn't it? And so we're like, is there a way without giving up that, is there a way we can maybe take that flashlight and adjust it so it anchors out just a little bit more? So... Here's the little pushback part. The above era that we just talked about in America and Midlothian is ending. There are increasing in our area de-churched and unchurched people. So outreach is no longer primarily collecting a certain percentage of those already inclined to attend a church and then building a relationship with them after they come. We still want to do that, but that's no longer the primary population chunk in our, in our community anymore. And so if we're to be faithful in outreach, outreach is now establishing a relationship with the non-Christian acquaintance first, before they show up here. And then through that relationship, inclining them to attend church with you. And so since the default of many today is an awareness of Sunday morning as church time, but no assumption that church is valuable or even an inclination to attend, there is no more social pressure on propriety or duty. And I can't believe that person doesn't go to church. The church has to then show itself to be valuable. We no longer have an assumption of value in the community. And so the presuppositions of need, to use business world terms, are public relations and demonstrating value. Thus, the presentation of the vision as a robust church, joyfully united to Christ, to Jesus, our community, and each other. See, the current vision, while from clear scriptural background, uses vocabulary resonating with non-churched visitors, signaling significance and relevance. So we haven't given up on orthodoxy and deep teaching Right? But we're also saying, but we're also trying to signal to people who aren't looking for those. We're trying to signal that this is what happens here is significant for your life. This isn't valueless. This isn't something that, oh, yeah, my grandmother used to do that. I don't know. I just go for her. This is real life here. And we want you to understand that. And this is also relevant to your real life today. All right? This is usually where people like to go, yeah, but. So. So please hear what I'm saying. We're not saying, so we've taken the focus of that, and now we're, no, we've tried to expand the focus to encompass all of that, which is hard. Yes? Yes. Outreach is now what? Or sorry, outreach. It's one-on-one -on -one relationships outside the church. So you go to your neighbor and you say, your unchristian neighbor, say, hey, this Friday night, I got a couple friends. We're getting together for coffee and we're going to play gin rummy. That's, that's two people. We're going to play rummy. That's, that's more than two people. There we go. Or we're going to play a board game. Or we're going to play something, right? And you just invite them over. You have coffee. You have conversation. You make your friendship. 
and they happen to be people from church, and that's it. You don't, you know, bait and switch them with the, all of a sudden it's a Bible study. No, we're not doing that. You're just building a relationship with them. That's it. And you do it again, and you do it again. And eventually, you know, eventually if the Lord is working on them, they will ask you some significant questions. They really will. And it may take time. I mean, I, I, I've told the story before. I'll tell it again. You know, when we lived in Boston, we had five kids, and my neighbor moved in, and he, he jokingly called himself a professional beggar for MIT. He was actually head of development. So he, like, was the person who got convinced people to give them, like, multi-million dollar gifts. And he was a little older than me, but his first and only child was, like, younger than any of ours. And he was just like, I remember one day after we kind of got to know each other, it was months and months, he's like, Sean, your house is so quiet. I don't hear yelling. I don't hear screaming. There's seven of you in there. How, how do you do it? How, how do you manage the, all those kids? My one child's driving me crazy. <laughs> you know? And I remember, I was like, Joe, you just asked me a really personal question that requires a, a kind of a religious answer. It, is that okay? And he's like, please. And so I was like, okay. You, you realize what my neighbor just said? My neighbor, na- my neighbor just said, will you tell me about Jesus? Right? He didn't say those words, but that's what he did. So I, was, I explained to him the gospel and how the gospel applies to parenting and home management. You know, that's what I'm talking about. In a, po- in a post-Christian culture, you know, especially us where we're on this transition where people still kind of respect. I mean, no one throws rocks at me when they find out I'm a pastor. We're still respected. But at the same time, people are like, yeah, but why? You know, what do you do? Why, what, what's that for? We're show, we have to demonstrate the value first. And then it may take two or three or four or 20 individual conversations before they're ready and you can tell they're ready, hey, would you like to come to church with me? And that's okay. Yes. But it's not even, it's not just one time, like you said, it takes multiple, but it also makes the, making the church open for other kinds of discussions, like the big backyard, the broken yeah. backyard. Because it becomes a church that's not for a service, but the place where kids can play together, or the fairs that we had that unfortunately got canceled because of the weather. Right. Exactly, yeah. It takes multiple steps. Yeah, exactly. It takes multiple steps. I mean, I can't tell you. I, I know others, you have too. You've told me. I, I've had at least six or seven conversations in the last year with people who find out I'm the pastor here. They're like, your park is amazing. Did y'all spend the money on that park? That's not a government park. Yeah, that's us. Why would you spend so much money to give a park to people who don't go to your church? <laughs> I'm glad you asked, right? You just told me to share the gospel, you know? So, yeah. I think we had 18 adults in the in the class. Yeah. Probably, I would say two of them were would, would say they were de-churched at one point. Yeah, none of them are completely nuns. So, but again, before we get to the other the other hand, just remember the main thing I want you to see here is that as we're for a certain group of people. They move into your neighborhood, you have a quick conversation, and you can tell. Invite them to church. For another group of people, that is like the last thing you're going to do, right? Evangelism and outreach, sharing Jesus, being a good missionary is going to be inviting them for coffee, helping them carry a box, something like that. You're not even going to try to invite them to church because they're just not there. And what, we want, we want, what the session wants you to see is that's okay. That pre-evangelism stuff really is okay. You're not just spinning your wheels. You're not, oh, I should have talked about Jesus more. No, you were great. Love on them. Okay? Show value. Overcome the slander that's out there about Christians. So I saw another hand. Yeah. Yeah, Yes. Do goodism is very well respected. Exactly. 
Right. Yep, exactly. What we're doing is significant. We're demonstrating value. Did Denny tell us a story about how he had, in his neighborhood, he was able to put a Ukraine table out to talk about their involvement, and people were coming by and talking about it, and how one guy was really struck by how, because I'm not religious at all, but this is really valuable what you're doing. See, we're demonstrating value to our neighbors. With, with some of our neighbors, as more and more un- or de church people come in, we have to recognize that they don't assume churches are valuable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we, we kind of always want to try to have a vision that encompasses that and says we're going to do, do that. All right, so where are we going? So fellowship, growing together in love. This is the value of live. It's about relationships. The metaphor is the church as a family. So it's congregation towards congregation is the action. Okay, I'm, going to, I'm not going to say anything new here. We're, just, we're trying to, all the different personalities are trying to say this in a way that everybody can resonate with, hopefully. So the, the, what we mean by this value of, so here's the value of fellowship. There's your biblical model. There's the action growing together in love. What's the marketing? We're going to live. What's the metaphor? It's a church as family. What it's about, it's about relationships. What's the action? Congregation towards congregation. We're a family together. Okay? Next is discipleship, growing healthy together. This is where we grow. So it's about knowledge. This is the church as a gym. Okay, we're going to be pumping iron together, right? So this is the congregation towards the Word, right? This is we want to get into the Word together and grow. The emphasis, it, it, you know, the metaphors, yeah, we're, we're, what did I put in here? Yeah, we're working out, we're going to get shredded in the Bible, man. So, all right, so equipping, becoming emboldened together, thrive. This is about discernment. This is the church is like an outfitter. Right? And this is primarily going to be the elders and the staff towards the congregation where we're helping you discern how best to see yourself in the world and how best to find opportunities in the world. We're going to kind of outfit you. You've gotten strong enough now, great. Now we're going to put the backpack on you. Now we're going to give you the hiking boots. And now we're going to give you the, the hunting knife and all the stuff. So we leave the gym to get all the equipment we need to use those muscles. And then finally, this is missional. You leave the outpost and you head out on the trail, moving outward together, go. So the church is an outpost and you move. This is where you apply all the stuff. And the action here is congregation towards the community. So you see the action. We've got congregation towards congregation. And then we got in our little cycle there. Then we've got the congregation towards the word. Then we've got the elders and staff back to the congregation. And then we've got the congregation heading out to the community. Okay, so this is kind of encompassing what we vision and dream about. And then finally, what is this last slide? What does this look like practically, like on a, sun, on a given Sunday morning? How do we kind of grab all these, all these values? So if you notice, we got worship there at the top, and then we got our value of live kind of comes together in the Venn diagram at the top, and our value of grow is over here on the left, go is on the right, and thrive is at the bottom. So you can read all those, but like on Sunday morning, we are doing both transcendence of God and the eminence of God. He's holy, and yet he's personal. Reverence and understanding and resonance and application, they're not contradictory. We can do both. The church is the ch- church focus. We sing songs that, you know, if you haven't been to church before, like, why are we singing about holy, holy, holy? What does holy even mean? Well, you will, you'll find out later. We also do unfocused songs, right? We, we, we try to have both. Again, we're trying to see by expanding our focus, we're not saying we're only going to reach these people. We're saying we're trying to reach Midlow because God put us here. So again, we have, we have gym and outpost. And then under grow, we've got Sunday school, fellowship time, the outfitter model, undergo more fellowship time because you can bring your pe- friends to this. Like, wow, what a, what a lively bunch of people. Communion as a family meal. There'll be more about that coming up in the next several months. Um, Sunday school, and then the kind of family mentality. So this is kind of where we are as a church as a vision. Have you noticed there's not a lot of real specific applications because the elders are like, well, we're not the Holy Spirit, so we're kind, of, we're kind of giving this broad umbrella and just seeing what the Holy Spirit does as we have these emphases. But we do hope in everything we do to try to be touching onto these four key values of live, go, uh, grow, thrive, and go as we do this together. Any questions about that? Anything you'd like to clarify about that? 
Great. Well, we ended right on time then. So um, I don't think we need the video. We, we went plenty of time. I want to give you guys plenty of time to fellowship together before the next service. Let me pray. <laughs> Father God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your leading your church into all wisdom. And we pray, Lord, that as we seek to be faithful to the scriptures, you would bless us. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.